Okay, welcome everybody to another joint webinar interview between 180 Circle and Responsive.org. I'm Glenn Marks and delighted today to introduce Sheila Meyerson. Today we're going to talk, uh, do a little bit of a deep dive into sociocracy. So welcome, Sheila. Great to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. So before we go into the, some of the details about sociocracy, um, tell us a little bit about your background. You have a nonlinear path to where you ended up and tell us where you came from and how you got to where you are. Yes, it is nonlinear. I started, my, in my first life I was a scientist and I changed course midstream and started a consulting business. So um, the, the very short version is that I, uh, my interest changed. I became very interested in how people collaborate or not. Um, so that was in scientific teams and in the classroom. Um, and now that's my focus in my consulting business. Okay, helping, helping build more collaborative teams and groups and an organization. Excellent. And how did you land on sociocracy? I had been I had been running my consulting business for several years and found out about sociocracy and recognized that it had answers to many of the issues that I had seen in companies. That was that was one of my my paths. The other is um, in addition to being a, a member of the Sociocracy Consulting Group, I'm also a partner in Blueprint of We California. And around the same time, I found out about the Blueprint of We collaboration process, which also helps people collaborate more effectively coming at it from a different, from a different lens. Um, and so I, I work with both of those. So presumably they dovetail well with each other? They do, and I do sometimes combine them. Okay. And... For those who are interested, uh, and you can refer to this throughout in the chat room, is a link to how you can get a hold of Sheila, some of the information, some of the um, slides she's going to present. There's also how you can contact me directly, as well as a link to my website. So, Sheila, many people, when we talk about self management, they have a lot of misconceptions or a lot of evolving conceptions. Um, I think the name that most people are familiar with when I have conversations is Holacracy, and largely because of Holacracy's work with Zappos, or maybe I should say the other way around, Zappos work with Holacracy. Um, we did have an interview with uh, um, John Bunch from Z uh, Zappos, and as well as Brian Robertson. So the number one question um, for people who are not familiar with sociocracy is, what is it? Well, as you said, it's a it's a way to run a a, a self managing organ self organizing system, self managing organization. Um, so, do you want me to focus on sociocracy or talk about the differences from holacracy? What order would you well, like? Well, whatever, however you want to take it. Just kind of give us a sense of, yes, we will talk about the differences and the similarities. So if you want to define sociocracy around that, that's great. No, I'll, I'll start out just talking about sociocracy. So it is, the, the word literally means governance by associates. Socius being um, in Latin for, um, uh, uh, for uh, people who have an association with each other as opposed to democracy, which is governance by the masses, not necessarily people that you have an association with. So that's, that's the root of the word. It was developed in the early 70s in the Netherlands, and it's a whole systems approach to decision-making governance and project management. And it, it, it creates more inclusive and resilient and effective organizations. Um, everybody has a voice in the policies that govern their work, and yet they get stuff done. Those two people having a voice and getting stuff done are sometimes seen as incompatible. So that's that's the short version. It, it, it does seem incompatible, and we'll get into the weeds in a few minutes to talk about how, how, as you have discussed in some of our conversations, it actually increases efficiency. But yes. Go ahead. I interrupted you. Take it away. Oh, that, I was pausing for a breath there. You, your timing <laughs> was just fine. So... 
tell us, before we delve into the differences and similarities to whole accuracy, um, tell us a little bit about how organizations that adopt this, what is the management system? Every, um, it might make sense for me to show my slide at this point. Yeah, right? I think that would be very revealing okay. and helpful. Give me a moment to, sh I have two slides about this, so give me a moment and I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, are you seeing it? Yes, looks great. Okay. So this is actually, this is the slide I want. So this is a linear structure for operations and this you've seen a zillion times. Yes, you, you, uh, usually 90 degrees. With the board usually board. 90 degrees and you'll see in a moment why I've rotated it, that's, that's intentional. Okay. Um, Gerard Endenberg was the person who developed socioc the sociocratic circle method, which is the form that we use. That was, the, uh, that was his original formulation. And, um, and he, he developed it to run his electrical, he was CEO of an electrical engineering company in the Netherlands called Endenberg Electric Technique. He looked at, a, at an org chart like this and said, I'm an electrical engineer. I know about power systems. I would never design a power system this way. There's no feedback, so you can't steer it. So that's what led to the development of all of sociocracy. Each group of people who works together on a regular basis periodically gets together for a circle meeting to set policy about how they're going to work, including how they work together. So let me show you. So this group of people will form a circle. This group of form, people will form a circle. And let's, I'll show you what that looks like. So these are those departments. I had showed three departments, it could be more. This is a general circle with two people from each of the departments and this, call them the general circle, the general management circle, they coordinate the activities of all of, of the entire organization. So, so Sheila, one of the things that, I, that stand out to me immediately, listening to your description and going back to the previous slide, is that the one of the significant differences is that there's feedback coming back to the general circle exactly and that's the reason to have the double link there's two people who are full members of both circles um, okay. and, and and the reason for that is that it can be very difficult for one person to accurately transmit information in both directions so this group of people if the elected links were not there the elected link is chosen by the department circle to represent them on the general circle. If the elected links were not there, that would be the, the management team. And they do meet just as a management team for operations. And then when it comes time for setting policies, the elected, the elected links or elected representatives, um, depending on what terminology you use, are there. So that gives feedback in, in both directions. Okay, so let's walk through a pragmatic example. Let's take the blue circle there on the right. Let's say this is the marketing circle. Mm -hmm. And how does the marketing circle in sociocracy interface with production? The, suppose this orange yeah, uh, circle okay. is production. They both are represented in the general management circle. So each circle, when, when the circle is set up, there's a carefully defined, a well-defined aim or set of aims and domain of responsibility and authority. So the decisions are made, it's a distributed leadership model. The decisions are pushed out to where the work is being done. So the marketing circle has responsibility and authority for decisions that govern activities that, that just affect the marketing circle. The same for production, for the production circle. Anything that affects both of them would be kicked up to the general circle and it would be part of their domain and there are people from both of those circles in it. So either one of these circles, if they're initiating a proposal, could bring a proposal to the general circle, but then the other circles are in on it to, have, to give consent. So in a, again, let's, let's get pretty concrete here. So, Production is making um, toys for Christmas time, 
marketing wants to run a special that may increase demand by 20%. They would go through the general circle to get a sign off on that. Is there a way that they can just go to directly to production and bypass the general circle and go, hey, we've got this idea? Um, the, 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 formal, the formal way is to go up to the general circle. Um, but but it's not, it, it depends. Um, it depends on how their domain is 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 um, uh, is defined, and how their domain of for responsibility and authority is is defined. And you know they they may have they may be talking to each other regularly, in which case fine. Um, so it can it can work either way. Okay. And what's the advantage of going through the general circle, the green circle, versus just directly talking to the uh, uh, people that are more directly in the loop, production? Um, well, suppose this is the sales circle and sales is impacted by this too. So if other groups are also impacted by it, you would want to get input and consent from everybody before going ahead with it. Okay, so the general circle is representatives from each of the relevant circles that are involved in getting the product or the service to the customer. Yes. Okay. And how are the operational leader and the elected link chosen? Good question. So the operational leader is chosen by the general circle to lead that department circle. So the arrow starts with the circle who, that is choosing the person and they choose it by, by consent and, and, the, and, and the arrow points to the circle that they, are, that they are leading. And then the elected link is, is selected by consent by this circle to represent them on the general circle. So in your experience with the different organizations and reading the case studies, how fluid is the oper are the operational leaders and the elected link? Are, are, is that role changing frequently or once it's decided, does that usually those same people carry that load for an indefinite period of time? Um, not indefinite. Um, every policy decision and selecting somebody to a role is a type of policy decision. Every policy decision in the sociocratic circle method has a, a time length and a measurement attached to it. And um, so that's true for role, selection of people to roles too. So we always indicate a time period. At the end of that time period, we're gonna have a new selection process um, and choose somebody again. And it, it could easily, it could be the same person. And in between, we would give them a performance review and the performance review is done, um, is done in a circle. Um, and uh, their development plan is, can, is, goes to the circle for consent. Um, so. And how does the circle itself determine new members? In traditional structures, the manager does the hiring. Yes. Um, so that's up to the organization how they want to do it. Um, any anyone joining a new circle, the entire circle has to consent to working together. So at some point, people will have to consent. Um, some organizations choose to have, if, if somebody's been hired into this department, for example, mm -hmm. some, some um, organizations choose to um, require consent of that circle before accepting the person. It could just be a you know, a team that's doing the interviews. It's, it's however they set it up. It just, okay. it just needs to be clear. So but, it, but it's easy to have, get input from anybody that you want to, okay. including the decision. I'm going to invite you to come back to um, speaker view here. I think we, if we need to refer back to that, we can this. Uh, oh, this, this Glenn, can I, just, can I just explain one other thing about this yeah, slide? Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to explain why it's flipped on its side. Please. So, so what this slide shows, we're used to thinking of the hierarchy as, as, a le, as a hierarchy of power. But what this shows slide, what this slide shows is that it's actually um, a hierarchy of level of abstraction rather than power. So 
Over here, this is the board circle, it's not labeled here. Mm -hmm. They have, as you move towards the left, it, you move towards a big picture perspective, long range perspective, and towards the right, you move towards a more specific or um, more concrete perspective. There might be more circles here. Um, and, and the reason why that's important is, I think of it like, like a living system in the human body that every, every piece of it has an essential piece of the, every part of it has a piece of the whole. In the human body, the organs talk to each other. And if you had the heart and the lung and the gut making a decision together, and any two of them could overrule the third, if, if the heart and the lung overruled the gut, you could be dead tomorrow, or at least very sick. We can't afford to lose the, the voice of, lose the information that any part of the whole system has. That it's the same in, in an organization. We need the perspective of the people who are looking out for the long range, the, the entire organization, the long range perspective, and the voice of the people on the front lines who are likely to be closer to the customer, they each have a different piece of the picture of the perspective and we need all those voices. And what this method allows us to do is to get all that information. Okay. So now I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, great. So this raises a whole host of pragmatic questions. And, and I wanna again compare traditional structures to sociocracy and, and get a sense of where the advantages are of using sociocracy. Mm -hmm. So in a traditional structure, if I'm in um, head of production, I'm the manager in production and we're lagging and I determine, gee, we need two more people. Then depending on my level of authority, I usually have to run it up the flagpole to somebody higher than me and say, okay, we need, we need two more people. They can either say, okay, we've got it in the budget or forget it. You can't make do with what you have. How does that process work in sociocracy? It might be the same. It might be different. It depends how the domains are defined. So one, one of the parameters that could be part of the definition of the domain is what budget can you spend on your own before you need to go to the next broader circle? Um, and, and, and that is decided in the general circle, or again, is that from organization to organization they make those decisions? Um, no. It, so I'm going to go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can see my slide? Yes. Okay. So the the board, which in, in sociocracy we call the top circle, the, the, um, the top circle sets the domain and the aim for the organization and for the general circle. The general circle sets the aims and the domains for each of the department circles. And suppose this marketing circle has some um, sub-circles attached to it. For example, there might be a website circle. Um, the, the marketing circle sets the aim and domain for any circles that are more specific than, than that department circle. So the, the budget is set by whatever the relevant circle is. Does that make sense? The budget for this circle is set by this circle. The budget for the general circle is set by the top circle. Okay. And as with any organization, as conditions in real time become more fluid. Yes. There's more sales, there's less sales, there's um, seasonal changes, then the decision-making process could get speeded up. Absolutely. Because you have that feedback circle. Absolutely. Like feedback link. Absolutely. Okay. Usually there are regular policy meetings on the calendar, but if there's not, or if you need one more frequently, because policy meetings happen usually less frequently than operational meetings. The, and, and the two the meetings are different um, for, and for different purposes. Okay. Um, you, usually the, if, if somebody needs a meeting more, more frequently, any member of a circle can, can ask the, the meeting administrator for that circle to call a special meeting. So let's go into some of the specifics of the circles outside of the general circle. That, that seems to be fairly clear. You've used the phrase a couple of times of decision by consent. Can you explain what that is and how that works? Absolutely. 
we do not use um, majority vote. Um, there's an exception to that, which I'll mention in a moment. The, the default decision-making method at every level is, is by consent, which is, a, which is one specific type of consensus, which I will explain in just a moment. The, um, having said that, a group can decide by consent that particular types of decisions would use some other decision-making method. For, for example, they could delegate some set of decisions to an individual person, or um, they could decide we're going to use majority vote for this type of decision. Um, so they're, they're, they can't, they're, other methods of decision can be, can be under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the main method is consent, which means absence of paramount objections. The basis for an objection is if if I could if 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 a decision if a policy if we put a policy into place and we think it would be it would jeopardize the aim of of the circle or of the organization that's the basis for an objection it's not personal preference if I couldn't do my job in that circle towards our commonly agreed upon aim that we agreed upon when the circle was set up or or, or you know, or afterwards if it's modified, um, then I raise an objection. So if you and I were in a group of several people making a decision and I were facilitating, I would say, Robin, do you have, um, sorry, you're, you're, uh, <laughs> I just realized your, your screen says Robin Zander rather than Glenn Mark. Okay. <laughs> I, I just read that. Um, I would say, Glenn, um, do you have an objection to this proposal? And she, and I'm, and you would say yes or no. And then I ask myself because I'm a member of the circle and then I ask everybody in turn, Either the answer is no, no objection, or yes, and here is my objection. Um, we pool all of those objections and own them as a group and problem solve them um, until we find resolutions to them. Once we have resolved them, that's it. There's, the decision is made, and until then, we don't have a decision. So we're not actually seeking agreement. We want to surface the objections because they lead to a better proposal. We want to know if somebody sees problems or risks that we can't afford to take. So every single person voices, in essence, an agreement or an objection. An agreement is a lack of, of an objection. That's correct. Okay, so it's, it's um, not explicitly an agreement, but they don't see a reason that this would jeopardize the mission, the purpose. The one way of asking the question that we use is, can you live with this? Meaning, can you still you do your job if we have this if we carry out this policy? Okay, so I want to get into the human side of this because that seems to be where all of the self managing, self organizing systems and structures run into challenges. And we've heard some stories uh, on previous webinars and in conversations I've had where people try holacracy, they try something and then a new management team comes in and says, you know, we're, we're, we're not interested in this, blah, blah, blah. But let's come back to the consent. I mean, I've been in a lot of meetings and if, when people go, can you live with this? I'm imagining somebody probably has a really solid objection, but just goes, you know, I'm tired of meetings. I just want to go back to work and says, yeah, I can live with this. How does sociocracy make it safe, make it part of the culture to where people feel like they're not a pain in the neck for bringing up objections or other people aren't looking at them and going, oh, Glenn again, this is the 14th objection you've had this month, whatever. How, how does all of that work to overcome two basic human instincts? One is to avoid conflict and the other is to disrupt. That's a great question. Um, in fact, many people find sociocratic circle meetings energizing. That may come as a surprise. Um, not all meetings. There's, mm -hmm. there's ups and downs. Right. But, but overall, oh my goodness, I, I remember one meeting I was facilitating of a, 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 in a client organization. It was, it was a meeting in the evening. Everybody had been working all day. That's when they scheduled the meeting. And, um, and people were tired coming into this. They, several of them said, I don't know if I can stay awake for a two hour meeting. And at the end of that two hours, everybody was energized. Um, 
So there, because there's often really creative thinking. Um, and I find a minimum of people who are just being disruptive. And I think the, the, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that especially with practice, they know that their voice is gonna be heard. Sometimes people are disruptive because it's the only way they can figure out whether they figured this out consciously or unconsciously, the only way they can figure out to be, um, to, to they think they're gonna be heard. Um, but the other is that everybody needs training in how to have meetings this way, and the facilitator receives special training. So meetings are real, the meeting formats are really carefully thought out, so everybody really does have a voice, and it, it seldom gets ground down. And when there is an objection or a series of objections, you mentioned, and then the, the circle resolves them. How, what's the process for resolving objections? Oh, there's a number of different ways we can do it. So we make a lot of use of rounds in which every, in a round, in a round everybody has a turn to speak. Um, they can pass, but everybody has a chance to speak without interruption and without crosstalk. So, um, and that, it sounds like it would take a lot of time and be inefficient, but in fact, quite often, quite amazing things happen from rounds and brand new ideas come out and people really listen to each other. That's the other thing. And when things, when meetings are getting ground down, in my experience, it's often that people aren't really listening to each other. They're trying to convince each other of the, why the other person is wrong and they're right. And that completely shifts using, a, using rounds in sociocracy. Partly because people can't interrupt each other. Correct. Yes, and they really do listen to each other because when it's my turn to listen, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say next to, to prove you wrong. I'm actually listening. So that, and that allows me to actually change my view. Um, okay, so you go right, there is a series of rounds. Everybody has the opportunity to either pass or express. So one, po one possibility for resolving an objection is to do a round. The facilitator will call for a round. Does okay. anybody have it? Who has an idea about how to resolve this? Or they could ask the person who initially made the proposal if it was an individual. It could be the whole group that developed the proposal and there's a whole process for developing a proposal. Um, but they could ask that person. They could, it could be something that requires some research. So they could uh, assign it to a helping circle, um, two or three people to do the research and come back to the next meeting with a proposal. There's, a, there's about 10 different ways, probably more, uh, different ways to, um, to, to resolve an objection. One of them is if there are like two or three people who have differing opinions to just have kind of a, uh, those two or three people have a discussion in front of, in front of everybody else, but for a set period, for a set period of time, um, because you mostly want to do things that are involving everyone. And if somebody still doesn't agree, then what happens? Um, well, it depends. Um, there's sometime, sometimes an objection, there is not a way to resolve an objection, and we need to go back to the drawing board and figure out a new proposal. Um, sometimes they have an objection um, because there seems to be some risk to them. Um, re remember I said that every policy has a time period and a measurement attached to it. And so every, every policy is viewed as an experiment. So suppose the time period for a particular proposal is six months, the facilitator or somebody else might say to the person raising the objection, what if we um, reduced it from six months to two months? Would that make this a safe enough experiment to try? And the person would say, yes, for two months I can live with it, but I wanna make sure that we measure such and such. And they'll say, great, let's make that one of the measurements and would you be on the measurement team? Okay. So sometimes, not always, but sometimes that will take care of it. And sometimes the proposal can't meet the objections and we need to go back to the drawing board and revise the proposal. Okay, so it, it sounds to me that this really goes beyond just giving lip service and actually is a structure that empowers every single person. I have seen countless meetings, both the ones that I'm in and of, where I'm a member of the circle and of clients, um, where a proposal seems straightforward coming in and it ends up much better by the end of the meeting because of this, because of this process. So tell us a bit about the, uh, the downstream benefits of using these types of conversations, this type of organization in terms of 
employer retention in terms of uh, absenteeism, in terms of profit and loss? All of those improve. Um, employee engagement increases, retention increases, sick days decrease. Um, the company, um, companies need to be nimble and agile in the, in the modern economy. And this provides a way to, a, a way to do that. It means using, soci using the sociocratic circle method means that the organization can get ideas from people in all parts of an organization. Many companies say that people are their best resource, but oh my goodness, I've had so many conversations with people who work in companies and say, all we have to do is such and such to fix that problem, but they never, they don't have a way of getting their ideas put into a form. Um, so it makes it real to make, make people, uh, you know, their, their, their best resource. They get better meetings, not, not necessarily immediately, but over time, meeting time generally decreases. Um, as m I've, I've heard of it decreasing as much as 50%. As I say, not immediately because there's a learning curve. Um, and it's also really good for leadership development. Um, because of the selection process, it surfaces people, the, the natural, the real leaders in any part of the organization that the people at the top might not know about. And people get to their, um, they're able to get into positions that are, that really play to their passion and, and skills and strengths. Um, so it's really, it's really good for leadership. So those are, those are some of the main ones. And I want to come back to this empowerment. What's clear is that if somebody has an objection, sees that certain policies and procedures are not in the best interest of the organization, they have a, a very strong voice there. What about introducing policies or innovations that others may not agree with? Are there forms of appeal, so to speak? I have a great idea for a new product and my circle is like, you know, we really aren't interested. But I'm, I'm adamant about this could really help the organization. Are there processes where I can, in essence, take it to a different circle? Um, I, I'd have to think about that. I, it's funny, I haven't seen that happen. Okay. Um, what, what I have seen, it, I mean, it, I'm sure it could, mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I haven't, or, what I have seen happen is somebody brings an idea to their circle and other people convince them, let's wait on that or let's do this other thing first and you know, come back to that later. What I have seen happen is um, there, there, there's a, 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 a story that's a classic story now about Endenberg Electrotechnique, um, which the company where, where the sociocratic circle method was developed, where they were about to do major layoffs and somebody in a different department that wasn't, wouldn't have even been affected directly by the layoffs came up with an idea to av avoid the layoffs. And it went up through the circles to the top circle quite quickly. And, they, and his idea was consented to by the top circle and they averted all the, the layoffs. So that's the reverse situation that you're talking about. Right, okay. So one of the differences that I'm gonna just point out with holacracy is in holacracy, and I want to preface by saying there are a number of self-management systems, but yeah. holacracy, there are circles and then there are roles. And yeah. so if somebody has a role within a circle, they have complete autonomy for decision-making process. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, it is different from sociocracy where decisions are made in a circle and then if a circle makes a policy decision, do they need to go back to the general circle to get their sign off on that? It depends whose domain that type of decision is in. Okay. If, okay. It's, in, if it's in the domain for their own circle, then no. But if it's in the domain for the next broader circle, then yes. Okay. And it sounds, well, let me, let me ask a few other general questions, and then I, I want to go into a few more specifics about the implementation. And, and, and I don't know if you want to return also to the differences between holacracy and sociocracy. Um, not necessarily. I'm not okay. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be all that productive. Okay. Um, tell me about 
diversity and inclusion. Is there anything inherently in a sociocratic model that would encourage hiring of diverse people? It sounds like diverse opinions are equally as embraced. You, you know, I, I'm thinking about in, in uh, this was in the Netherlands, this was founded, um, which is a reasonably homogenous cultural, it, it, that's changing quickly, but it wasn't in the, in the outsets. But is there anything about sociocracy that would naturally attract more diversity? Or is that like any other organization, that's a conscious decision? Attract more diversity. That's an interesting question. There are, there are definitely things I can, aspects of sociocracy that would, that I think would help foster diversity, support diversity within mm -hmm. the company. Um, and as far as attracting them, I, I know that companies where the employees have a voice in the policy decisions, um, that people are more engaged and they tend to get more people applying. So whether that's specific to getting more diverse people applying, I don't know. I don't have any data on that. That would be interesting to find out. I would love to start collecting some data, by the way, to, to see if if sociocracy helps the company um, handle the diversity and, and increase the diversity, um, both in terms of, of, of retention and in terms of promotion, um, because I hypothesize that it would, and there's a couple specific aspects of sociocracy that I think support that. Well, I'm just gonna throw this out to anybody who happens to be listening. If you work in a company or you would like to, uh, if, if this gets you all jazzed, uh, gee, this would be a great study. Uh, you can contact uh, Sheila through LinkedIn. I've also put up at the top of the chat room and we'll review that one more time before we close. Um, I think that would be a benefit to all organizations that are looking at diversity and inclusion and how to, how to bring that out of theory into reality. So when I'm listening to all these benefits and I'm thinking I'm a CEO of a company, um, I'd be foolish not to use it. So why isn't it ubiquitous? Why, what are some of the objections to sociocracy? What are some of the uh, failures, the failed to launch? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's the failure to launch and then there's failure after launch, which are two separate things. <laughs> Um, I think it has to do with the mindset. I think a lot of leaders think in terms of um, that the way to endure is to um, is to is to control the structures and the processes. But in fact, in a self-organizing system, that's not the source of endurance. It's it's resilience and flexibility that is. It feels like giving up control in order to get that. And that's a leap for many people. It's a leap, leap for leaders. It's also a leap for people at other levels of the organization who now have a voice that maybe they think they like just going to work every day and having somebody else make the decisions. Um, so it's a, it's, a leap for, it's a leap for everybody. It's a culture change. And some of the situations that I know of where a company started out using so the sociocratic circle method and then stopped, it was because the person or, or a few people at the top reached their, my interpretation of it is they reached their level of, their comfort level, and, and then beyond that was going to be, it was, it was too, there was discomfort associated with it. I think those, those gaps can be, I think, I think that can be bridged, but it takes some conscious attention to do that. I would think it would take a lot of conscious attention. Um, so let's go back to the everyday person, not at the top or the far left side of, of the uh, circles. Um, it's one thing to get hired into a company that has sociocracy already. You mentioned there are some people who just want to be told what to do, they want to go to work. How do those people fit in who don't want to go to meetings to decide all of these policies? When, and I'm going to 
come back to holacracy for a second, when Zappos implemented holacracy, they had a buyout program. So anybody right. that felt like this doesn't work for you, right. will will give you some severance pay. Um, they still have that policy. People go through their initial training and they do a 30 day training. And then if people don't feel like they belong here, um, they, they have some financial avenues for leaving. What happens when uh, sociocracy is put in place? Is there a typical exodus of a subset of people who just go, this isn't for me, I don't want to do this? I, I'm not really sure. I, I, I'm sh there certainly could be. Um, one, I, I saw some numbers recently about number of people who leave when there's a, a change in a company. But if it's, if it's for this kind of a change, there's typically more, the, the, applic the applicant pool increases by a higher percentage than, mm -hmm. the, people, than the people leaving. So, so there's trade-offs. But I don't have any specific data about that for sociocracy. I do have wonderful stories of people making, making the transformation yeah. and their lives changing. And, and it's, it's, there's something about the, the structure and the processes that support that. Mm -hmm. uh, even even just by themselves, that that has been a surprise to me. I really had underestimated the impact of the structure until I started working with sociocracy. Well, it fits in nicely to all of the responsive principles of yes, the experimentation, the balance between purpose and profit, and people feeling more connected with the the day-to-day -day operations, people become much more engaged. Um, is there an ideal size company? So again, making a comparison to Holacracy, um, Brian Robertson identified about 2,000 people as being, once it gets above that, the company gets to be too large to effectively implement. Um, in sociocracy, is there too small of a group? or too large of a group for it to work effectively? Yeah, good question. The smallest that I know of is three. Three and different circles, three people? Three <laughs> or, people, absolutely. Um, in, in our consulting, uh, the Sociocracy Consulting Group, we have six members currently. We're in, we're in three different countries. Um, we have multiple circles. Some people are in more than one circle. Mm -hmm. um, but we found, it was a surprise to us when we first started, we all met in one, one, one big circle. And then we said, okay, it's time to set up a sociocratic circle structure. And we were surprised ourselves that now we started really getting stuff done, even with just six people. Um, the mm -hmm. largest that I know of that has implemented sociocracy company-wide is about 2,000. And I know of several organizations that size. I know of larger international companies that have used it in one division. But I, I do not know yet of a, of a company that has implemented company-wide more than 2,000. And but that's just what I, what I know of, so it's possible that there are more. And are you familiar with companies that utilize it when there's a remote workforce or a distributed workforce, people working in different cities, different countries? Absolutely. My, my consulting group, we're in, none of us are in the same city and we're in three different countries. And I... I worked with, with one organization, I, I've worked with others that are virtual, but I'm thinking of one in particular that's, that's almost entirely a virtual organization. They have one or two in-person retreats a year. And they just started getting so much more done um, when they started implementing sociocracy. And we're not gonna go have the time in, in the remainder of this interview to go into all of the details about the constitution and the agreements and things of that nature. How difficult is it? to implement from a more traditional or a responsive or a responsive leaning type organization that already has some buy-in on these ideas. What are we looking at time-wise? An organization that maybe has 500 employees to get trained, to implement it, to get the feedback, to get some of the big kinks out. What's yeah. the time process? It depends in part on how fast they want to move ahead and what kind of resource they want to put into it. I've seen, um, I've seen organizations, smaller organizations, not 500, um, implement it all at once, where everybody will be trained all at once and we'll coach the circles um, for the first uh, few meetings after the, after the training. Um, 
Um, and then for larger company, it, usually the way they do it is they'll start with one part of the company or with one project and, and then roll it out from there. Uh, mm -hmm. it, ideally, they will um, have, they'll, they'll designate one or more people who are internal to the company who will get additional training and support from us to become internal training trainers and coaches for the circles um, so that, that they're not always dependent on an external consultant. Um, and so it depends on how fast they roll out all, all of that. I, I gen, I've seen, I've seen um, a big change in a few weeks when an, when an organization starts implementing sociocracy, um, certainly within a few months. Um, for, the, for a real culture change, for that to be embedded in all their processes, um, I, I, the number that occurs to me is three years. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, that's, I'm sure it's shorter for some and, and, and longer for others. Three, three years is probably about the mean, just because people just take a while to adapt and they take and, and it's, you know, like it, we all have lifelong habits and it, it, right. we have to change some of those habits for this. Right. And under stress, we, we regress to our previously learned behaviors. And the process, if somebody is interested um, listening to this, they would contact you and you would have a conversation with them. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. The, and, the yeah. best, and the best way to contact you is... Uh, well, there's, there's, there's two ways. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, we've set up a website, um, a web page on our website for people to go to from this interview. And it's um, sociocracyconsulting.com slash responsive. And that, and that URL is in the chat. Yes. And that has information on how to contact me. Um, it also has a link to a, a new white paper that we've just written about sociocracy. Um, and so you can get that from, on that, on that web page. Um, or you can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. And I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone. And just want to make a couple of announcements regarding uh, responsive.org. Uh, we are launching the first Responsive X in San Francisco in November 8th on the topic of optimizing mental health in the workplace. Uh, I will be emceeing that and, and facilitating part of that uh, conference. If you want some more information about that or you want to register, uh, currently you can go to my website, 180circle.com, and that URL is there and there will be a link to registering. If you want to communicate with me at Glenn, it's Glenn at one circle, uh, dot com. If you want to be on, find out more about um, responsive activities in the future, you can go to responsive.org and sign up for their newsletter. So you offer some, let me turn this into a question. Do you offer some classes and courses or some introductions for people who are going, I'd like to learn more about this, but we're not ready to sign on. And, and how would people get a hold of that? And, and what is it that you offer? Um, well, there's, there's two ways for that. If you go to that link, um, the sociocracyconsulting.com slash responsive, I direct you to the listing of events on our website. Mm -hmm. So some of those are scheduled. They're, right now, they're not scheduled very far in advance. So if you're looking for something that's not there, please just contact me. Okay. Um, and, and either I'll tell you when the next one is that we just haven't gotten listed yet, or we can set up a special one for your organization. And, and you mentioned earlier that some organizations decide to introduce this just in a department. Yes. See how that works. Yes. Is there, in some of the tools and some of the tra um, trainings that you provide, is that sufficient for somebody to go, you know, before we go system-wide, let's just do it in our circle of six people or eight people or something like that. Can they implement that without going through a full engagement with you? They, they can. Okay. Yes. And, and presumably you're available for consultation on that. So yes, if they get they're still gonna they're still gonna need training, um, but it's 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 gonna be more limited. Yeah. Okay. 
So obviously you're sold on this. You've been doing this for a while and you're a big proponent, not just proponent, but you're propelling people and offering tools for collaboration in the workplace. How do you see this, both sociocracy and self-organizing, self-management um, playing out in the workplace in the next 10, 20 years? Do you think it's a inevitable or do you think it's subset of organizations are well suited and others aren't? What's your view on that? Well, my guess is that companies that continue to stick to the old top-down command and control. I just think that they're going to need to change in order to survive in this economy. Mm -hmm. That's my prediction. I could be wrong. <laughs> so, but, but that's exciting to me that, I mean, the exciting part of that to me is that, that this will become more, more common. And, and what, what moved, what's particularly meaningful to me about this is, is creating environments where everyone's contribution is valued and where people love going to work every day. And I've seen that happen in organizations. And um, so that's, that's exciting that we can create more workplaces that way. Um, but the downside is that some companies aren't gonna do it and um, that will follow, you know, keep, keep going down the old path. The, the, the advantage of, of getting everybody's input and everybody's best thinking and engaging everybody is, is both that, they, um, that they're more engaged and lead more fulfilling lives, the companies get the best thinking of everybody, but it's also necessary not only to run the companies, but just to solve all of the issues facing humanity right now. Um, we're we're going to need everybody's thinking. Yes, I, I agree with that. So this has been delightful. Uh, for those who are intrigued about uh, self-management, uh, we will have uh, is a joint effort with Responsive, um, another talk about self-management systems without a focus on a specific system, but more in terms of general self-management. Uh, that will be November 5th with Doug Kirkpatrick. You can check out my website, 180circle.com or responsive.org if you want some more information. Those are not listed yet, but they will be shortly. Any final thoughts before I let you go, Sheila? This has been quite enlightening. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, I, I, I can um, suggest an experiment for people to try. Next time you're stuck in a meeting, just try around. And give us the rules one more time. Everybody gets a turn to talk in turn it's not popcorn and people can pass but everybody gets a gets a chance to turn to talk without interruption and without crosstalk fantastic all right and if those of you try it uh, drop sheila or i a line and let us know how it's gone please do all right thanks a lot bye-bye thank you glenn